you know, courage is a choice and fear is your opportunity to exercise that choice. And nobody said courage is going to be easy or fear feels good, but at least you have a choice. And the, the, the last one is the most important, it's, it's choice. Whatever you decide to do, there are benefits and consequences to every choice. And the, the messed up thing about it is, is that sometimes you won't realize the benefit or the consequence until you've already made that choice and gone through the benefits or gone through the consequences. And that in life is called experience. Where, and it, and it's, it's not about us being right and making that wrong. It's just letting them know that when you do make choices and there are more consequences than benefits, just know that you have a choice to make another choice. And then you have people like us that are here to support you. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Hawaii Real. I have with me, buddy, Kaipo Paiva. How you doing, Kaipo? Good. Thanks, Thanks for having me on, man. Thanks for coming on, man. It's been uh, a while. We've been trying to get you on the show for a few weeks now. Yeah, you and I are like mixed up in a whole <laughs> bunch of other stuff. <laughs> and that's what we wanted to talk about, like all the things that you're mixed up with. Um, you know, because I have my my job, I have my side business, and then I have the podcast and I have some other things going. You know, what about you? What do you got going? Where do I begin? Let's see. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, the hat. Yeah. So we like the hat and it's rep. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. So Kaipa's, Kaipa's bringing in these masks from the mainland. Nice. And then got nice logos. You got a bunch of different um, designs, designs mm-hmm. and everything, right? Do you have a website and everything? And I got an Instagram hats. page right now. Okay. Yeah. I love the hat. So this is like a beach type of hat or a oceans water sports kind of hat. Freaking love it. You can like go paddling and stuff and you get it wet and it'll float on water and just hang it up and it'll dry and it's it's good to go. A lot of you guys like that. I'm surprised how many um, people bought that one. I didn't know how well it did. Well, for me, it's like the only time I really wear hats is when I go mm. outside or on the beach or something like that. So this is perfect. Thank that's, you. Thank you so that's much. That's the good on the war on skin cancer. I'm really happy to hear that. Yay. So I just, I literally just started that like three months ago. And I, um, I was, I was just looking on the website out you know the covid covid thing started you gotta stay home you can't go shopping and i, I looked and i i look and i'm really picky and i was like you know I, why, why am i looking at other people's stuff why don't i just i want my own stuff so i started you know looking at designs i was like oh i like this one i like this and then people had to start wearing masks and so i was like i want to wear nice masks you know like something that i want to wear or it's just instead of just plain black something that's comfortable and so i found this company and um, I found these two companies, one in Vegas and one in Singapore, and um, they both produce really great um, products and, and, and it's cost effective to keep the cost down for everybody. And, you know, and I, I think in, at this time where we're at, it's, I think it's important for um, police officers and law enforcement to be to, have to feel supported and to be a little bit to be proud of, of what we're doing and, and our whole goal of what we're doing here. And. And so I just started offering it to people and I, oh, I wore it once and said, where'd you get that from? And I was like, oh, you, well, you want one? And I made a bunch and a 400 masks later and then I made another one and here we are. And you're telling me like your first run, you ran out in, in like a day, sold out. Well, my first run, I, t- I took pre-orders because I w- didn't know how well it did. And it, w- it was like 400 masks. And then my second order, I made a different design and I didn't want to, I, I, like I'm a police officer, right? I'm, I went to Damien High School, love that school. I almost got my AA degree from Leeward. I'm 12 credits away from my AA degree at Leeward. Uh, and and I don't have any kind of business sense. You know, I don't, I didn't know what I was doing. And I, um, I, I started, I do a lot of personal development work and I was reading a book and, you know, just like kind of what we were talking about earlier about taking risk when you got an idea, just, you know, go do it and you're going to have problems. I mean, I think, I think in my opinion, what, I was afraid of the problems that I wouldn't be able to handle it. And, um, you know, other books say like Robert Kiyosaki and all start small, start, start something manageable. And in the book where, um, um, uh, I just slipped my mind, tough, tough times happen and what uh, tough people perceive. I, I, I forgot, I just forgot, it. but it, it's, you're going to have problems and it, it, you can fix you know, make a decision. And if you're unsure of what's going to come out later, then, you know, you can adjust all. Is this something that's easily fixed? And so I started small. I started with pre-orders and I created a little bit more designs. And now I'm, I've sold in maybe in the last month or and a half, maybe close to a thousand masks. Just, oh. Yeah. So 
Um, I mean, it, I've, and I'm, I've shipped my mask as far as Chicago, Illinois, I, you know, Vegas, um, California, um, uh, all over the place. And I, Hilo, Kauai, uh, the neighbor islands, they, 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 they see my stuff on Instagram. I was like, of course I'll ship it to you guys. You guys are our brothers and sisters out there. And so, yeah. So you're mainly shipping them to uh, law enforcement? Uh, well, I, I, at first it was just going to be only for uh, law enforcement people. And then I, I was like, you know, there people are asking me, you know, I'm not law enforcement, but my uncle is and I support you guys and I really love what you guys do. And I really, you know, I was wondering if you sell it to us. And I said, I usually don't, but you know what? You support us. And the whole goal is to get more support for our law enforcement community. And so I said, why not? And I started sending to the, the, to send it to them and then. They come back and they say, well, you know, what? my my uncle who's a cop wants more. And so I said, well, sure. You know, and I think that's that's really important for us. You know, it, it, it's, it's just it's about sharing um, who we are as a police community. It's, and it's not about, oh, us or them and the cops. And and so um, like I'm in community policing and the whole like for the last 10 years, I'm, I'm a police officer with the Honolulu Police Department. and I've been assigned to community policing and. Being in community policing for the last 10 years has given me a different perspective on why we do what we do. And so I, I teach the community policing class at, um, the, to, the, to the recruits every year. Every year, And before they had the, re, the community policing class during the regular curriculum, and I said, hey, um, you think I could be, my, my block could be given um, could be put after they, they finish, you know, SCIs or their final testing phases. From the academy, their From final the, testing. Yeah, because in that part of the academy, you're kind of stressing out. You have all these things to worry about. And here I am, who have a, I have a four-hour four block of community policing, which they're not going to be tested on because they got bigger things to, to worry about, like, you know, like EVOC and, and uh, search and seizure and laws and pers- um, policies. And I said, you know what, why don't you guys take that block so the recruits and the, the, the staff can use it for something that's going to be, they're going to be tested on at that moment so they can get through. My stuff, um, I think my stuff takes time to develop their skills. And so I said, can I, can you move me to after they finish SCIs? And they said, yeah. And so we moved it. And, um, and so I'm all over the place, but I'll probably start at the beginning of my community policing um, endeavor. Uh, well, with uh, today's, you know, um, national emotions about policing and stuff like that, where do you see uh, the future of policing with uh, regards to, um, like you said, you're in community policing, you know, all these years. Where do you see the future of police work and the community and the merger of that? You know, people are talking about defunding, dis- dismantling police departments and, you know, funding these other programs and whatnot. Uh, where do you see the merger in the future of that? See, I don't, I don't know what's, if it's about defunding, more like reinvesting. And it's, I don't think it's either police or either social worker. I, I, I think that's where, where the, in my opinion, I think that's, that's where there's kind of an error where it's either either or, where I think maybe both end could, could probably work better. Instead of either the police handle this and either social workers in the house about, um, we find a way where, well, well I, I work with, I think it's pretty much community policing. It's community policing. Uh, and if you look at the word community, it's about you leveraging resources where people work together towards a common issue. And so I, I think community policing is a direction that we've, we're finally realizing that we're going to go. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you, you, know you're, you're, you have a, a bad diet and you start eating whatever you can. And finally, the doctor says, oh, okay, um, you, got di- you got high cholesterol and you, you got to do something and change your diet. And then you, you can either go on medication or you can change your diet. But if you go on medication, you're going to have all these other issues at the same time. But if you go on your diet and change your lifestyle, yeah, it might take a while. It's not an instant fix, but the long-term effects of it and the long-term investment you make in changing your lifestyle and changing your diet, that'll have a longer elastic effect. And I think that's the same with community policing. Um, the thing about community policing, it's that it, it's not an instant fix or an instant change. And I think things got to way they I think things in my opinion I think things got to where where they are now and it's an echo of 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 what we didn't invest in in the past and we're seeing the effects of it now and um community policing is all about 
taking a different perspective on what what policing is about and i think the perspective when i when i when i gave the cl- when i started giving the class i never really understood there's these two slides i was I, I teach and i never really understood but i finally understood it like three years ago i've been in like 10 years <laughs> in community policing i just found i just realized the two slides so i i think what the the perspective that um, a lot of people have is that they view crime and police as the root to all challenges. And um, when you make, um, if, if crime is solved, if, if police will just take care of crime, all these other problems will disappear. But if you look at it in a different way, it's, well, what's causing the crime? You know, um, uh, uh, drug use, poverty, um, um, single single uh, single parent. I'm not saying nothing against single parents, but um, you know, um, parents aren't in the home as often because they're working so much. And it's it's not. I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying they got to do what they got to do to survive. But the way the economy is, and you know, the economy has an effect on it too. The way the economy is, it causes parents not to be home with their kids to teach them these these values that they learn to get the job, and and they're doing their best. And I I think. Um, when you view like if police people uh, there's a there's a stigma or this there's this mindset that says if police would just solve crimes or if police would just stop crimes all of our problems would disappear and um we have done our thing we have made arrests and still not much has not much has changed what community policing does is instead of making um crime and police the center or the goal to or, or, or thinking that the mindset where this will solve all our problems, I think if we change our mindset to the solution of what if our goal was community wellness and peace? Like if our goal is to create community wellness and peace, what we do um, becomes a resource on how to do it. And we're no longer responsible on it. You know, there's a lot of, when I first got into community policing, I thought, well, holy cow. You know, the, I, I went to neighborhood security watch meetings. I went to neighborhood board meetings and they go, well, what are you guys doing about this? And what are you, what are you doing about the um, homeless person who has um, mental illness over there on the street? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I can give them a citation. Yeah, you should go cite them and arrest them. And I thought to myself, what will a citation do for this guy's mental illness? And then that takes us into the realm of homelessness. And when um, at Hans Laurent's Park, there was a lot of people who are homeless and I don't even like to use that that um that label residentially challenged Red, resident, yeah. and, and and from you know I work with like officer Ma, Kili Makanani does a great job with our um our that, our homeless population over there and he knows everybody by name and I think that's really effective and what Captain Lambert's doing with the health program that's totally awesome too and I think they're finally starting to see and we're finally starting to see together is that I think if you view it as a homeless problem. And in community policing, the whole purpose of community policing is to go out and build community. And so talking to people and talking with people, not at people, and finding out their names and how they got there. And now what I realized about you know the issue of homelessness, it's it's because we label it homelessness. And I don't I don't think homelessness is a is the issue. I think mental health is. Because, you know, they're, they're saying, well, it's a shelter problem. It's a shelter problem. But when, from my experience of when I went out, um, these human beings who are choosing to be out there, a lot of them who are choosing to be out there um, have some mental challenge or some addiction challenges. And, you know, you kind of feel for them because I here's one, one guy who can barely stop eating ice cream, right? And... <laughs> There's guys out there who have an addiction to something else. And and I think, you know, I don't think it's a homeless problem. It's more of a mental health issue. And they're, we're sending police officers who have minimal training on how to do some uh, or help people with mental health issues. But yet um, we're expecting them to clean it or fix the fix the situation. But police officers can only do what they're trained. Like anybody can only do what they're trained to do. And for six and a half months, every police officer is trained to do enforcement and write reports and make arrests and be safe and make the scene safe. And when we send police officers, you only can do what you know. And 
in a, in a way, I kind of, you know, I went and sought my own kind of training and I thought to myself, you know, what I know and what to do as a police officer is not really effective. Um, it's, it's not that we didn't want to do anything. It was more of long, along the lines of we don't know what to do. We're only doing what we're trained to do. And I think that's cool with, you know, Captain Lambert's doing is he sees he sees that I think we're going to be, need other other agencies to jump on board and focus on the issue. And if if law if if enforcing a law is what it takes to get them to move along, then we can do that. But if they need counseling or addiction counseling or um, social uh, social services, um, I know a lot of social services, and I don't I don't know all of them that can help these people. And I think once we start getting them onto the the track of maybe start with counseling and just being out there with them. And I think that's that, you know, Captain Lambert and all the other community policing teams, they're doing a really awesome job. Yeah, Captain Lambert's going to have to watch this episode because you've named him like three or four times. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I mean, he's He's been doing a great job. Um, but when I look at what he's doing, it's like, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. That's not what the police department is necessarily supposed to be doing. Like he's filling a role that, uh, in my opinion, is not traditional of the police department. It's traditional of like some other departments and stuff like that, which we just aren't, we aren't, we don't have that here. We're not doing that here. So the responsibility kind of just naturally falls on to the police department. And I think nationwide, when you see, um, you know, these protests for defund the police department, people are finally waking up to realize that, yeah, we've been putting too much of a load onto the police departments. And maybe we do need to scale back a little bit and put that load, you know, where, where it needs to be, where it should be. And I'm all in favor of that. I mean, if you can have other, other types of people and other types of professions taking care of the homeless problem, kudos, you know, that kind of releases the police officers to actually yeah, if you, do if what you, they're trained to do, which is enforcing laws and, you know, investigating. And like, I mean, like patrol, if you send patrol officers out there, if you think about it, patrol officers are like an ambulance. They're, they're emergent workers. They, they, if, if, if something traumatic, unexpected happens, I think that's what you want to leave um, patrol officers available for. And so, you know, I'm not saying that homeless issues are, isn't a problem, but you're exactly right in where expecting officers to go over there and get these people help. I mean, officers want to help them. We don't, we're still trying to figure out, okay, uh, who do we call and how do we help them and will they follow up on them because we have a whole list of things that people call for and people do. And at the same time, I think it, um, a lot of officers are frustrated because they do want to help. Like there are a lot, we have a, a 90, 99% of the officers are compassionate. They want to help people. And it's frustrating as a police officer when you don't know how to help someone. And there's a feeling of helplessness and, you know, it's, and then, and, and, and at the same time, they're doing their best. And, um, it, I can, you know, it's really frustrating when you want to help somebody, but you don't know how, and the, the, the resources that you have, you understand that, that that's not the help that they need right now. You know, putting somebody in jail right now, giving a citation right now is not going to help their situation right now. In fact, a lot of police officers can see what can be best to help these people. And it's frustrating. All right. So uh, we were talking about community policing and I wanted to bring back um, to the fact that you have um, this logo on your products, on your masks and your hats. Um, and a lot of people aren't going to know what that, the significance of this logo, what this logo is. Can you shed some light on that? I'll do my best. So if you look at the police, the RHPD badge, that logo is actually in the middle of it. Like we're in the dead center middle of it. And I looked it up and I was like, what the heck is that? And so I Googled it and they have this thing called the law. Of, it's, it's called, it's from the law of the splintered paddle. And so the story goes where there was a war on, uh, and King Kamehameha was in the war on Hilo and on the big island of Hawaii. And he came across these fishermen and farmers and th they were at war because he was trying to take over. And so he went over there and tried to attack them. His foot got caught in the, in a rock. And <clears throat> these are just fishermen that he was trying to attack. They yes. weren't warriors. They were just fishers. They were just there fishing, minding their own business, doing their thing. They weren't involved with the war at all. Uh, Kamehameha ran up and was going to attack them. His foot gets caught in the, in, in the rocks. 
the fishermen get scared because all they want to do is leave. They hit King Kamehameha over the head with the, the, the paddle and they run away. Kamehameha goes unconscious and um, he wakes up and, you know, they find these two guys and they bring them and Kamehameha pardons them and he says, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fight. They weren't involved with the war. In fact, they were just minding their own business. And the law of the Spanish paddle says, you know, even when there's conflict, there's people that's not involved, they let them pass and let them go on their way. And kind of like the guardian mentality where actually these are the people that we want to protect. And so that's, that's, that's from my understanding of the law of the Spanish paddle, like more of the guardian mentality. Yeah, because the fisherman splintered the paddle over his head. And that's basically. why, yeah. You probably know more than me. I they cracked they cracked his skull on that thing, but he's a pretty pretty big dude. So, and we don't know the content of that paddle, but they knocked him out. Yes, according mm-hmm. to the story, they knocked him out. Um, I think anybody less probably would have been killed by that blow, but <laughs> knocked him out. But, um, but yeah, he, I guess he had a change of heart um, after that uh, after that incident, and he really looked towards protecting um, the people. Yeah, and, and which is pretty much the whole goal of. If you look at, in my opinion, I think police were, police officers should should go back to the term peace officers, because when you make peace your goal, how you solve a problem can look more than a million different ways. You have a lot more options. If and and so the first question I asked the the, the officers, the recruits, and the, I said, you know, what what's the purpose of of law enforcement, or what's the what's the purpose of police officers? And they, a lot of them were all of them will answer. To enforce laws. Right, because basically we're known as law enforcement officers throughout throughout the country, right? LEOs. Yes, law enforcement, which is a title, right? Yeah. And, and so the next question is, is, okay, what's the purpose of law enforcement? And what would you answer? Oh, to enforce the, the laws that are set forth by the legislature, yeah, right? Yeah, why? Why, 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 why? why do we need to enforce laws? To protect the society that we're in. Right? How does enforcing laws protect the society? It takes the bad people away or it forces, you know, people to obey the rules that are set forth. And when people obey the rules, what does that create? Peace. Exactly. And that's why if you make your goal peace, law enforcement becomes a mechanism and not just the way of doing things. And so my, the first message I send to them is, is don't only look at, don't mistake what you do for why you do it. If the goal is to create peace, sometimes in my, I mean, I don't know if as a young, our youngest as a patrol officer, what I found was sometimes when we when we enforced the law, it actually created more conflict, especially like through the people that called, which is not the goal they wanted in the first time. And I, I'm not saying we shouldn't follow policies and procedures. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is um, sometimes law enforcement may cause more conflict than peace. And in my opinion of the whole purpose, I mean, why we do law enforcement or why enforce the law is another perspective I have is we want to change a behavior. So, for example, I mean, I go back to speeding because that's the most common people. Uh, a lot of people complain about speeding and it's like, well, if police officers would give more tickets, people would stop speeding. And I said, well, can I give you a different perspective of it? They say, sure. OK. Anybody here have multiple tickets before? <laughs> I mean, there's people that have been given multiple citations and yet they still speed. They still speed. Right. And if, and if, if citing people stopped speeding there would be a trend of less and less citations as as time grew on, right? Yes. Like, they would show that it worked, but it doesn't. Like, there's still a lot of speeders today as there were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So, it's, it's um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mentality where there's a belief where it says, well, if we enforce more, we'll change their behavior. Not necessarily so. Um, and that's why community policing is a little bit different. Uh, we have this program, the Ottawa Pahu, it, um, with the Waipahu Elementary and Honowai Elementary called the RAP program, and it stands for Real and Powerful. And just to go a little, it's going to delve a little bit more further into how I just start things with not having any idea how to do it. The RAP program started back in like um, 2010, 2009, uh, before I, one year before I got there. I got there in 2010. And what the RAP program does is work with sixth graders there. And we worked with the, the most challenged school in Waipahu, which was at that, at that time was Waipahu Elementary School with the sixth graders where they had high truancy, a lot of high suspension, a lot of suspensions. Um, a, a lot of the kids would drop out at sixth grade. They would, just, they would just stop showing up. And so the school was, can you come and do something with the kids? And we're like, yeah, of course we can. What are you guys going to do? We're going to, they gave us an, an hour with um, with the kids to be in class and to do stuff with them. 
So I said, yeah, we'll, we'll go in. They were like, well, okay, thanks. And then we looked at each other and said, what are you going to do? They are like, I don't know. <laughs> we'll figure it out as we go. We were never trained to teach kids, but if that's what it's going to take to help this community, well, well, the worst thing we could do is we end up in the same place we are now. And so the whole goal of the RAP program, we went over there and the whole goal of the RAP program was just to build relationships with kids and give kids, the youth in the White Pago community, a different perspective of a police officer and what we do and why we do what we do. Um, and so we started off with like the basic classes, like, you know, don't do drugs and juvenile laws. And, and it started with just four or five classes. We did like the fit for life exercises with them, the importance of being physical, physically fit. We had like five classes back in the day. And so <clears throat> I met these two other officers, um, Don, Don Famuina and Taylor Hopi, and they had this class called the ABCs of Success. And it was totally cool. I saw it. I, we have guest speakers come in because we only have so much content to give them. So they came in and they gave the ABCs of, ABCs of Success, which stands for Attitude, Believe, Courage, and, and, and Courage at that time. And so they gave the class and I was like, oh, that's super cool. And they said, well, Kipes, um, you want to learn how to teach it? I was like, yeah. So um, they gave me the content and I did my best to teach it. And I didn't know at that time, Taylor and Don, Taylor Holt P and Don Famuina were going and doing per, their own personal development and leadership training on their own, like they pay for it out of their pocket. And so they said, do you want to learn more about this? And I said, yeah. So he turned me on, turned me on to this company called Clemmer and Associates. And they're, you, you can look at them, they're a really cool company. Brian Clemmer used to live here. He lives in the mainland and created his own company. His own company, he passed away. The company is still going and they teach a lot of uh, character de development, relationship building, community building, and um, leadership skills. And so I was like, yeah, you know, I think the kids could really benefit from this. So we're fast forwarding now. Um, Ten years later, we have we still have juvenile laws, but we don't call it juvenile laws anymore. We call it the importance of rules. And in, in that class, you know, instead of just teaching them what the laws are, I mean, you, you can teach anybody what laws and the consequences of the laws are. It's still, unless they're afraid of being arrested, it might not change. And for the most part, for, for society, they'll you know they'll go, well, I don't want to be punished, which is fine. And other people who don't see the significance of following rules or laws. So in that class, the sixth graders, we teach them, you know, how many of you like laws and rules? And no hand. Maybe one or two will go up right, in sixth grade. And they said, well, how many of you guys like laws? And maybe like one or two hands will go up. But um, so I, I, in that class, I teach them, you know, <clears throat> anybody play, who, who likes football in here? I thought, who likes football? And, you know, all the boys raise their hand. They go, cool, cool, you guys like football? And I said, well, you know, here's the cool thing about, I love, I like, I like, I'm not a fan of football. And they're like, oh, I go, yeah, you know, like there's 11 guys on the field, right? There's a goal at each end and they run around and kick this ball and, and they kick the ball and they try to score a goal. And they look at me like, well, no, that's not football. I go, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. But my, my, my son, my stepson plays and my wife, they go, no, no, Officer Kaipo, you're talking about, about soccer. And I said, oh, I see, I called it. Football, because in Europe, that's what it's known as. It's, it's football. You're talking about American soccer. You, were you guys thinking about American football? They go, yeah. I go, well, American football, there's 11 guys. There's two goals. But what's the biggest difference of those two games? They're two completely different games. And they, 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 I let the kids answer. And they say, well, you know, the rules. I go, let me get this straight. How many of you guys like soccer? You know, some hands go up. How many guys like football? A lot of hands go up. They're both very similar games. So what are the biggest differences? And of course, the first answer is, oh, the ball is different. I go, that's true. The ball is different. What else? And they say, the rules. And I said, so tell me about that. I mean, there's two games and they're played differently. You, Some of you say you have more fun playing one game than the other. And they say, well, it's the rules. So I go, let me get this straight then. Rules make things fun. And they're like, wow. Okay, good. How many of you guys like to feel safe? Every hand will go up, right? Okay, good, good. How, who walks to school? Almost every hand. All, all these kids there, they come from um, the lower income housing area. They're really, really good kids. They're really good. They're all like, Samoan, Filipino, Micronesian, Marshallese. And you know what? They're all great kids. I, I, I mean, if there's anybody who's colorblind or like, I don't understand a race either. I, I, it, 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 that's a community portion I teach. And so I how, how many of you guys walk to school? And they all raise their hand, most of them. And they go, do you feel safe using the crosswalk? They go, yeah, that's what, I mean, you, you feel unsafe and you don't use the crosswalk, but I, when I'm in a crosswalk, I feel safe. And I said, can you imagine 
what it would be like if there were no laws around a crosswalk and around stoplights. And they're like, oh, I go, what would happen? They go, well, you could probably get run over because there's no rule. And they said, oh, I go, so when you're in a crosswalk, you feel safe. They said, yeah. When you're on a sidewalk, you feel safe. Yeah. So rules help us feel safe. And they come to the conclusion, not me. And then we give them the juvenile law section where we tell them, these, if, if rules are there for you to help you feel safe and, and for you to be safe, the state of Hawaii has created a separate set of laws for our youth like you because we want you to be safe. And then they now they take a different perspective. And so <clears throat> we give them a different perspective of police officers, but our goal is um, to build relationships. And when I, I'm, very, I'm really, really careful when I go and listen to the kid. When I first got there, I was like, no, you're wrong. That's, that's not the right answer. And I, I was like, you know what? This their perspective. They're, they're sixth graders. They've been on the planet for like 11, 12, 11, 12 years maybe. And they're just giving me their perspective of their environment, of where they work and what they do. And for me to make them wrong about what they saw or what their parents tell them, it's not making this really, it's not strengthening this relationship. And so over the years, I learned that listening, listening is a super important um, characteristic and a skill that and anybody can, it's beneficial to anybody and everybody. And I think, you know, I, I was thinking in the academy, there's not much um, listening exercises that we do yet. We want to get information from people. And same thing with building relationships. I think the best way to show that you care about somebody is not say anything and shut your mouth and open your ears. And so when when I started listening to the kids say, yeah, wow, can you, can you tell me, like, how did you come to that conclusion or why do you think that? And they said, well, <clears throat> am I, this is what I saw in my neighborhood. And the, or this is my parents tell me, like, oh. And I don't say, well, this is how it's supposed to be. I, I like to use the term. Are you open to a different perspective? And me being the police officer and stuff, they're like, oh, yeah, I am. But they, they choose to listen, at least... They, and at least if you give the kids a different perspective of a situation, at least now they have a choice to look at things differently instead of forcing it on them. Because when you give them autonomy to choose to view things differently, all of a sudden when they choose, it becomes their choice and they become responsible. And or that's their kuleana after that to, to be responsible for whatever results that's created from that choice, which goes into the ABCs of success, which, call it, which stands for attitude, believe, courage, and choice. And, and that's where, that's like the foundation of rap. It's, it's all about, we don't tell kids what to think or what to believe or what to choose. The whole goal is we give you guys, you know, there's two types of attitude, positive or negative. You know, how you want to view your pers the, the situation is totally up to you. I'll just let you know that there are benefits and consequences to every choice, to every attitude. What you want to choose to believe in is totally up to you too. I'm not going to tell you what to believe in. But in every belief, there's a benefit and consequence. And of course, courage and choice. We tell the, I, you know, I tell them, you know, the whole thing about courage is courage only exists if fear is present. I mean, if there's no fear, what's the purpose of, of courage? Right. If there's no danger, <clears throat> then you're not being courageous. No. You're I just mean, being yourself. And I, I, and in my, in my, my, I have another coaching business called Coach Claypool, and one of my, one of my sayings is that, <clears throat> you know, courage is a choice, and fear is your opportunity to exercise that choice. And n nobody said courage is going to be easy or fear feels good, but at least you have a choice. And the, the, the last one is the most important: it's, it's choice. Whatever you decide to do, there are benefits and consequences to every choice. And the, the messed up thing about it is, is that sometimes you won't realize the benefit or the consequence until you've already made that choice and gone through the benefits or gone through the consequences. And that in life is called experience. Where, and I, and it's, it's not about us being right or making them wrong. It's just letting them know that when you do make choices and there are more consequences than benefits, just know that you have a choice to make another choice. And then you have people like us that are here to support you. If there's anybody that wants you guys to succeed, it's us. Because if you guys out are, if you guys are out focusing on your goals and your dreams, and that's our goal, is you guys have goals, you guys have dreams, go get it. I don't care what it is, as long as it helps people, it helps yourself, and it makes your life better. As long as you're not hurting anybody or damaging anything, I mean, go get it. And and if I can keep you focused on your goal 
and, and, and your dream and you're not out on the block doing something not, you know, you're not supposed to do, um, we win. Everybody wins. And I think that's the whole goal. It's, you know, there's a saying called win-win. I mean, you win, I win. It's, the, it's, it's, it's peace after that, right? And I think everybody deserves that. You know, it's when you have your business, I have mine. It's not that I want you to fail or to do bad. Or, it has no bearing on mine. If we both win, then shucks. And I, I think in community policing, there's a way where we both can win, you know, where, where there's got to be some leeway in between that, that there's going to be times where people aren't going to f- follow our instructions, even though our goal is to create peace. And there are people out there who's going to go against us. And, you know, we don't want to hurt people, you know, and we don't. And we understand that working with the community is most beneficial. And it's, it's not about us or them. And, I, and when I was younger as a police officer, I used to refer to, you know, the public and the cops. And I, kind of, I caught myself in, you know, the last five years when I say, well, our community believes this. or Because we're a part of the community after we go home and we go back to our community. We're an island for crying out loud. And when we realize that we're all together it changes the perspective of, of what we do will affect our relatives and our neighbors and everyone else. Do we even need police? Well, I mean, you mentioned earlier that we needed, you know, the difference between the, sem- the semantics of police officers, law enforcement officers, and peace officers. So the question arises, like, what do we need in society, right? Do we need law enforcement officers? What do you think? I, um, I think you need people... The CHOP is a great example how, you know, they were like anti-police. They, they said no police is allowed. And then yep. they created their own. The six city blocks in Seattle that was closed off. The CHAZ in Seattle, right? Yeah. And they said, you know, no police allowed here. Fine. And they ended up making their own security detail is what they called it. With guys with guns. And pretty much their own police department. Right. Almost immediately they did that. Yes. Right. Barriers and borders so, and walls and like, we don't want police we're going to set up this little peaceful area and almost immediately we created our own law enforcement and we built walls around it to keep everybody out and we started id checking people it's like sounds familiar mm, yeah it sounds actually worse than what it was before right seattle wasn't that bad to work around and be around i mean i've been to seattle a couple of times so it's, it's a nice place right? it is my brother lived there for almost yeah. two decades but um like going along, if, if people, hypothetically, let's say if everybody stopped breaking laws and rules, right? And it was like, well, well the police, you're going you're gonna to work your way out of a job, Kaipo. Mm. I said, well, only if your goal is to is law enforcement. If your goal is to enforce laws and rules, then you're one out of a job. But if your goal is to create peace, then law enforcement, that, re- that mechanism, how you do it, maybe you won't use that mechanism. But as long as there are human beings on this planet living in different areas and living places, you're always going to have different perspectives. And then when you have different perspectives, you're always going to have some kind of conflict. And when you get into a conflict where people can't resolve it at that time, at that moment, and you want to call a third party to resolve that conflict, to come in and create peace, then you're going to, you're going to need somebody to, to like a mediator right? all the time. And that's, that's true with like nationwide. Um, here's a one fun fact. Like, I think it was 60% of all police departments in the country have 10 or less officers. Right? Yeah. So you're looking at the vast majority of police departments are tiny, teeny tiny, you know, a lot of rural police departments, but they're still police departments and they have like, you know, one or two guys that just, they're the sheriff and the deputy Mm -hmm. They run, you know. And they handle their stuff. They handle their stuff. Yeah. But they, but you still have them. Yeah. Uh, Kahuku is a, is a, is a community to kind Mm -hmm. of highlight where. You know, you, you have the guy. I've never worked out there before, but I, I'm the, when you get to see somebody from an officer from Kuku, and it's like, how I, you're in the police department still? I thought you retired. No, I'm still working Kuku, <laughs> and it's how are things out there? And it's like, good, you know. And it's you, you, the officer. When I meet youth from Kuku, they say, you know, officer so and so, and I say, oh, I, I don't. They go, how do you know him? Oh, he works. He's a police officer in Kuku. I was like, oh, that's cool. You you know him by name. And it's, it's the real, a lot of the, what I noticed too is a lot of the officers that work in Kahuku um, are from Kahuku mm. and they understand the whole, um, the way of life out there. And it's, it's really cool because 
it's it's oh you better watch out i'm gonna call so and so to come and if he gotta come talk to you and the police gotta come and and it's it's they they create peace and i'm i'm not gonna go along the lines of policies and procedures but um Sometimes an arrest is not what's needed in order to create peace. It's it's more along the lines of, I mean, the Hawaiians call it ho'oponopono or counseling or mediation. And I think that's a really, you know, a really valuable skill for police officers to have. It's, it's Sometimes a, an arrest or a citation won't solve what the problem is here. It's it's more along the lines of listening and mediating between two parties. And it's pretty much at the time. A lot of, a lot of times, a lot of the problems are caused by miscommunication. So if a lot of the problems are caused by miscommunication, won't a lot of the, a lot of the solutions be a result of communication? And you know, I think that's an important um, quality for our police officers to have. Um, so I was talking about Waipahu Elementary. Now I'm gonna. You know, we have another program at uh, Waipahu High School called the Adopt a School Pro. Oh, it's, it, w- it was called the Adopt a School Program. It was it was funded and and done by the FBI. This guy named Arnold Laanui, an amazing FBI agent. He was actually given the task, and he shows up, and he he says, "Well, I'm gonna, you know, I want to work with your school." And so, um, what Arnold Lanui, well, Arnold Lanui did was we, we had this program for ten years, and he actually showed at the seventh year how crime and juvenile arrests decreased in Waipahu. And I think the other um, stat that that wasn't recorded is the way people in the community were treating the officers. So in the area, in like the Pupuola area, um, that's where a lot of our I, a lot of the kids that I work with and. Before, when you drive in, you got to bring a couple of guys with you to mm-hmm. kind of watch the cars and while you go in to address the 911 call. But nowadays, um, after we started the program, you know, people came telling me, like, oh, okay, I went I went to the poopoos the other day. And um, the, the kids, they ran up to me and they said, hey, do you know Officer Kaipo? And I was like, oh, yeah, why do you know Officer Kaipo? Like, yeah, he teaches us over And now they have, at least they have some kind of dialogue mm-hmm. to talk about instead of, of uh, you, you know, you effing cop or whatever. It's like, hey, well, what's your name? Well, I'm officer. So, oh, it's nice to meet you. You know, and that little change right there. And, you know, before officers were going to Waipahu High School almost daily. And now, I mean, there's still calls there, but it's it's not as often. And when they get there, it's um, the officers are treated a little bit with more res- with more kindness because, you know, they, they, they see a different side to police officers or they see the human being in the police officer uniform, so that was that was pretty cool. Um, so that if you go on FBI.gov, you can actually watch the video, and, and if you Google FBI um, Adopt a School Program, and it shows the the stats and the success of um, Arnold Laanui and the program that he started there, and it was pretty cool. We started with, well, well, well how do you want to do this? You're like, oh, I don't, I don't know, but I I got some classes to teach you. What do you got? I was like, oh, we'll jump on too. I got some classes to teach too, and so we've developed a curriculum there and. Um, hope my goal is to like package all this curriculum and may, and hopefully find a way to teach it to other police officers and other departments and and, and teach them how to d- develop and build relationships in the community with the people, um, not just the youth but also you know churches, businesses, schools, and develop a community and so we can leverage those resources so all of us can be involved into to solving community issues and creating community peace together instead of only relying on the police to kind of do anything. It can get kind of stressful when people rely on you to take all their work. Um, but when you give ownership to the community, you'd be surprised. Um, the community is very resilient and very resourceful, and they know a lot more things than a lot of the officers do. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's like, well, do we know anybody that could get us a truck to, to haul away all this trash because we don't have a truck with HPD and we don't have... Um, funds to, to they're like oh no i got a truck in my business i got, I got guys and sometimes you know people think that i need money in order to solve this problem well you don't you might not need money of well, what do you need money for well we need money to get this well what if we can just get the resource instead of trying to get the money to get the resource how's about we go and ask the people who have the resource and the worst they could do is say no and we're in the same place we are now and um you know, it's 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 cool at Waipahu High School. That it's a really different school. Um, it's, if you go on there, if you if you're a police officer, you walk on the campus. Don't be surprised if kids come up to you and say hi, officer. And um, uh, the suspension rate dropped sixty percent wow. in ten years, and it stayed at that rate where it drops. I mean, there's still, I mean, it's not perfection, but at least 
there's a lot more kids coming to school. There's a lot more um, people we can touch. And, and the, the cool thing is that um, the training the, uh, the training division, you know, they want to see if they can figure out a way to get, uh, they have a law and justice program at Waipawa High School. Mm -hmm. And so they just started about three years ago, Kelsey Yamamoto, who's a wife of a, a SWAT officer, Derek Yamamoto, and um, Ian Ferris. I, I knew him from from little league days, I knew him as a as a kid in high school, and and we were, we're still we're still like he coaches high school, high school. But anyway, uh, the whole point is that all, all these relationships that we have are are really great resources and relationships. Maybe oh, you you don't they may not be able to benefit you now, but the whole point about it is that a relationship is a and a community is a is a cohab. I mean a a synergistic kind of uh, relationship where. It's not only about what I can get from you. It's well, how, how can I help you? And if you if 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 I need help, you know, I'll ask you. And if you can't help me, great. If you can't help me, great. But the whole point about it is that let's make this community a better place, you know. And um, but Powell High School is great. Keith Hayashi, the principal there, he's very open. I never realized how challenging it could be for a police department or a police officer to get into a school. They're very um, cautious about who they have to come and teach their students, which is really good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They protect their students and stuff, which is cool. But Keith Ayashi is very open-minded and uh, he communicates well and he asks, he asks for support and there's some times where um, we're, we're able to go and help them. For example, you know, we have this issue with um, this guy walking on campus right now. Are you available? I go, oh, no, I'm, you know, I'm at training at the main. I go, I go he goes, oh, don't worry about it. And then he'll, you know, they actually feel more comfortable calling 911 and you know the patrol officers and everybody else kind of works together, and they understand that we have a we have a program there, and and the, the the school understands what the officers go through, and when you have that kind of empathic and um, uh, compassionate kind of understanding with each other, it really makes the the, the community a, a lot nicer to be in. Um, and so, the Waipawa High School Adopt the School program started off, and it morphed in, and it and it grew into the Law and Justice Pathway, and the the goal, the hope is that. You know, just like how the army recruits people, um, students to go into the reserve program, uh, our goal is to see if we can recruit some students after they graduate into the cadet program into HPD. Um, a lot of times, where we lose a lot of applicants for HPD is that time where they're 18 to 21 years old, where they're not eligible to apply for the as a recruit, um, where they make those decisions, and that's why, you know, it's super important when we teach youth how to make decisions and make choices and understand the effects of their choices, how it affects the entire community. And so um, that's pretty much the whole foundation. Yeah. I like these, uh, you know, I like your designs and we're taking it back to the masks here. Um, you're showing one with Aloha Essential. Love that. Aloha is essential. You're talking about essential workers and everything. Well, no, Aloha is essential. First of all, like, especially if you're going to be a police officer here or a police officer anywhere, you know, the, the feeling of aloha should extend um, in your day-to-day -day work, you know, here in Hawaii and anywhere, really. I mean, if you're going to be a police officer, you know, you got to have that empathy. You got to have that compassion. If, if you don't, what are you getting in the police department for? Like, you have to really want to be a police officer here um, to do the job. I mean, it sucks sometimes and it's hard. Mm. You know, it's not an easy job to get, number one. Um, a vast majority of people that take the written test don't pass. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to get even get the people to take the test. Yeah. Um, the pay is decent. It's not great. You're not going to get rich. You're not going to get wealthy. Um, and getting into the police academy, most people that get it, uh, most people that get in do uh, uh, pass nowadays. But it's rough. You know, not everybody that gets in the police department or gets into the academy passes. Um, there is an attrition rate. Mm -hmm. You know, my class. It was one of the big ones. We uh, started with 43 and we graduated with 13. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, that's telling of how difficult and how arduous the process can be. And yeah. at the same time, it kind of tells you, it tells you like the standards that the police department holds. It's that we're not just taking anybody. There, there's got to be a certain uh, uh, people that, that are willing to do what we're going to do because they yeah. see things and do things that we're going to to do in order to help people. And we get the bad ones in sometimes, you know, yeah. you gotta weed those guys out. And like, uh, the final design you have here, choose peace with a little peace symbol, choose peace. And, uh, a little word that says essential. Yeah. All right. So they can find you on Instagram. Where can they, where can they, uh, find you? What's your address? 
Um, I, I, you can search me on Instagram. It's um, it's kind of abbreviated. It's E S N T L underscore P C E, and the whole I can't. It took me a while to come up with a name because um, I wanted to kind of brand it, and and my whole thing about it was I was catering to, uh, focusing more on uh, law enforcement, and I say, well, we're, I mean, we're essential workers, and at first, at first it was just going to be essential, and then if you Google essential clothing, and it's like a whole bunch of them, and I thought, well. Essential piece came up because I was thinking about a puzzle piece, and I think we're all, everyone is actually an essential piece towards peace. And if you look at it that way, if 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 you, and it goes along the lines around my, around my community policing background, is that you understand when you when you understand that what you do and what you say has an effect now and later, and how it affects our community now and later, when you make peace your goal. When, when your goal is to create peace for yourself and your community, um, your decisions can change and you understand it better, how it benefits the community. And that's why I picked the name Essential Peace. Love it. Kaibo, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It's been great. Talked a lot. You promised you would and you did. <laughs> Appreciate it, but thanks. I didn't, my first time being on a podcast. And you did good, man. It was great. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. All right, everybody. Kaibo Paiva. And as always, stay happy Hawaii.